What's up, Canada? Welcome on Into Soccer North. I'm your host, Andy Petrillo. Can you believe we're less than a week away from the start of the Women's World Cup? And by the way, isn't it nice to have a World Cup in the summertime? The Canadian men, they're out of the Gold Cup, but man, was it ever a valiant effort against the Americans in the quarterfinals. We're going to be talking all of that stuff on the show today with some very special guests. And that includes one soccer analyst, Oliver Platt. We talk about the Canadian men at the Gold Cup and which young players impress the most. I also sit down with Bev Priestman and talk about some of the players who have impressed her since the Canadians won the Olympic gold in Tokyo. CBC Sports' Sharina Med also stops by before she leaves for Australia. And we talk about some of the roster decisions Bev Priestman made, in particular, the young 18-year-old Olivia Smith. But first, let's get you caught up on all the Canadian footy highlights. It's your favorite segment, Keeping Up with the Canadians. Bianca St. George was in action for the Chicago Red Stars against the Houston Dash. St. George had a great opportunity to put her team in front, but her shot was cleared off the line. However, Lady Luck would smile upon her because St. George would grab an assist after the shot from her teammate would deflect off of her into the path of Penelope Hawking, who would convert the opportunity in the 68th minute to help the Red Stars win 1-0. Picking things up in Sweden, where Clarissa Laracy got the start for her side, BK Hacken. Laracy wouldn't disappoint, would score with this diving header in the 75th minute. That goal would be her sixth goal of the season, and the game winner as her side went on to win 2-1 and remain top of the table. Despite the strong season for Laracy, she was left off Bev Priestman's World Cup roster. Switching over to the Gold Cup quarterfinal, where the Canadian med side were in action against the United States, Herdman was quoted calling this one a battle of David versus Goliath in Cincinnati ahead of the match. We're going to pick things up late in the second half where all the drama would begin. All the things were happening. American striker Brandon Vasquez would head home the first goal of the game in the 88th minute, putting the Americans in front. You'd think it would be over, but oh no. Canada would equalize after winning a penalty from a handball from Miles Robinson. Center back Steven Vittoria confidently grabbed the ball and would convert the penalty to send the game into extra time. Deep into extra time, it was Canadian winger Jacob Schaffelberg with nerves of steel. He would put the Canadian side in front with a sweet strike into the bottom corner. However, luck favored the Americans. Dane St. Clair, magnificent save, only to see the ball cruelly deflect off of Scott Kennedy and find the back of the net. The game would need penalties to decide the match, and it was American goalkeeper Matt Turner who would emerge as the hero, saving two penalties, breaking Canadian hearts to win the game for the Americans. It was a valiant effort by the Canadian side, which after a slow start, really did grow into the tournament. Now, despite the loss, second half substitute Schaffelberg really made an impact in this match. Using his pace to challenge defenders, he was rewarded with his first goal for country. He joins the likes of Ali Ahmed and Moise Bombito as young players who have shown their promise as future call-ups to the national team. Let's welcome to the show for the first time here on Soccer North, Oliver Platt, analyst with One Soccer. The Canadian men, they're out of the Gold Cup, Ollie. They go on the quarterfinal stage, but not without a fight against the Americans. And even though there were a lot of veterans on this Canadian squad, we did see a lot of new faces, a lot of players getting their first cap for Canada. Did one in particular, I'm just going to make you choose one, stand out to you as a possible starter for the 2026 World Cup? Yeah, I think I'd have to go with with the answer that I think probably a lot of people are giving coming out of that tournament, which is Ali Ahmed. Um, he stood out, particularly, I think, in, in the group stage where you understand that the quality of opponent is a bit lower than, than you're going to face in a knockout stage or at a World Cup, certainly. But I, I think one thing I look for always with, with young players coming into this team is just how they kind of build relationships with the more established players around them on the pitch. Um, can they play at the same tempo? Can they kind of think the game in, in the same kind of way as the top players who have more experience and have played at those higher levels? Because the tempo of the game does go up in international football when you're playing against better opponents. And I thought Ahmed showed his ability to do that, um, you know, particularly in combination with Richie Larea down that right-hand side, who was one of the more senior players on that team. He showed he was on the same wavelength as, as Larea and could connect and combine in, in really promising ways uh, down that flank. So certainly looking ahead to 2026, when he's going to be in the, right in the prime of his career, but even I think over the next few months going into 
the windows we're, we're hoping for later this year. I think Ali Ahmed is, is someone John Herdman will go back to pretty quickly. We can't help but look at one position in particular as well, and that's the goalkeeping position. We know Milan Borian played in the first two games. Due to injury, he leads the tournament. Dane St. Clair steps up. What did he show you about his ability to compete for that number one position? Do you think it's now going to boil down to him and Max Cripo fighting for that starting spot? Yeah, I think it's going to be a really difficult one for, for John Herdman to manage because I don't think Milan Boyan has any intention of relinquishing his spot, right? I think he still sees himself, you know, continuing as Canada's number one goalkeeper, potentially even being able to go to the 2026 World Cup, even though a lot of people would say that, you know, obviously that, that might come too late in his career. So it, it's going to be a tricky one for the coach to manage in the sense that Boyan has been a big leader of this team. He's very much an emotional leader. Uh, he's got a strong connection with Herdman himself. I think both of them, you know, think think the world of each other. But at the same time, Herdman has to take that dispassionate and, and objective view of who is going to be my starting goalkeeper in the long term here. And particularly, like you said, everything revolves around that 2026 World Cup. I thought Sinclair did, did a lot for his case in this tournament, um, not just in terms of his play, you know, in, in, only in two games, obviously, but also his off-field demeanor, the way he, he stepped up as a leader. He was included in, in Herdman's leadership group that he consults on on the big decisions. You could see he was a more vocal presence on the training pitch and in games. Um, so I th certainly think he did himself no harm in, in these couple of games he had. We understand, Ollie, why big name players like Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David, Kyle Laren, Tejon Buchanan, we can go down the list. Eustachio Atacubi ended up leaving as well the team. We know why they needed the rest. We know why some of them even had to report to new clubs. Do you think CONCACAF needs to do a better job at scheduling those two tournaments so perhaps some of these bigger name players, it wasn't just Canada, we know it was the U.S. as well, will compete in both? Because now you're kind of left with what could have been for Canada at the Gold Cup, right? There's a couple of issues for me. One is that they're playing the Nations League and Gold Cup back to back. And I think the top players in that scenario are always going to pick the tournament that's shorter and that involves purely games against their biggest rivals in the region, right? You're not playing Guadeloupe and Cuba. You're playing against the best teams and and, and you're getting a chance to to win a trophy pretty quickly. Um, the, the second issue for me, and, and this is a, a difficult one because I think obviously, you know, hosting tournaments as a financial aspect, trying to grow the game in the region and all those things, but I think playing the Gold Cup every two years probably uh, is is a factor in, in some of these players not necessarily wanting to show up to every tournament. Um, I think when you, you compare the European Championship, for example, that's played every four years. And even if you're a top player who has a long career, you might realistically only get three chances to go to that tournament, right? And, and three chances is not a lot of opportunities to win it and to lift that trophy. And so you're not going to miss one. You're not going to say, well, this is this is going to come again for me pretty soon. So I, I'm just going to take this one off because I've had a long season. So that I think is part of it as well. Um, like I say, whether that's something they'll look at as to, as to with the Nations League in play now, could the Gold Cup be every four years and, and be a bit more prestigious for that reason? I think there's probably a lot of different reasons that, that would have to be considered as to whether that's viable or not. But for me, that plays a part as well. Pleased to have back on the show head coach of the women's national team, Bev Priestman. You know, Bev, heading into the Olympics, there was a closed door game that you played. And based on the results, you made some changes that altered the way your team looked in Tokyo. Obviously, you walk away with the gold. You have a closed door game coming up as well on July 14th against England. What is it that you're hoping to see from that match? I think where we've been and the amount of injuries and changes, I think the biggest thing probably compared to the Olympics is I think in certain sort of units, there's many interchanges and, and options available to us. I don't think it's like this is the 11. And I think that's quite exciting for any player to be part of. Since the Olympics, a lot of players have made some big moves to big clubs. How do you think those players' transfers will translate to the national team? Yeah, I think, firstly, they're all training with better players every single day. I think long-term, that makes for a better player. But then, you know, as a coach, you, you start to say, well, how? why will we win this thing? Why can we win this thing? And the reality is some of our players are in environments where they're winning every week. They're winning trophies. They're playing in front of 30,000, 40,000 people. And so when you go into that opening game and there's 30,000 people there, these players have lived that regularly. And I think that makes a huge difference. So I think the confidence levels, getting better every day, training with better players, and then performing on the biggest stage to try and win silverware is, is massive in terms of contributing to where this, this group wants to go. 
Bev, the win at the Olympics, a lot of that is being attributed to really strong defense. But we love to see goals. So who are you relying on to score? How are you approaching your offense? I don't think we're going to rely on one individual player and probably nor should we. Um, I think we put a lot of emphasis on set plays and midfielders joining forwards. And I think, you know, probably the first three or four days here, the players would tell you that we, we put a lot of work in that part of the pitch to because that's the part of the pitch that's cha changed so much due to injuries. And so I felt we needed to get some partnerships and some understanding, you know, what type of cross does this player put in and what type of run does that need? And so I think it's going to be similar to what you've seen where this group, you've got midfielders who can score, you've got set players, we've got more goals from defenders than we've ever had, I think. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a blend. But what we do know at the highest level and, and in the women's game now, they're not huge blowout scores that go and win World Cups or, or Olympic Games. One goal typically on top 10 opposition, that's what it is. And so, you know, we, we'll have that in our locker and then we'll defend for our life and we'll we'll make sure we're a hard team to beat. And I think that's a critical component of our identity. Is there any player in particular who has surprised you since the Olympics, who you, you've seen their game grow? I think there's quite a few, you know, like Chloe Lacasse, I would say, is, is really... So start to grow in confidence in this environment. I find anybody who's not really been in our youth system, it takes them a while to get used to the tactics and the way that we work. But I think like Chloe Lacasse, we can't take away from, from what she's done. You've mentioned Julia Grosso's really grown in, in her role. Across the board, the group have risen. And I think that's not just us. I think the world has risen, you know, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but genuinely... I look at, you know, you're putting the training teams together for training and 2-11 versus 11, it's a, it's a brilliant place to be with, with this group and it's just exciting and you can feel that. Jesse Fleming, this is somebody who is really emerging as the face of this team. How do you think it's best to utilize her skills on the pitch? Yeah, I think Jesse, the, the good thing is with Jesse, she, she's versatile. So she's played in the 10 for us, she can play a lower down. I think she, her movement off the ball is critical and I do think seeing her higher up the pitch allows the interchange to happen. But I think Jessie, just working with her in Vancouver recently, I, I compare, I worked with her a year ago before we went into the qualifiers. Her game is just going greater and greater and greater. She's got super high standards that sometimes can be to our own fault. She's really hard on herself, but I think massive jigsaw piece to this team. I think everybody knows that. You're scouting Canada, you're scouting Jessie Fleming. Two of the countries in your group at the World Cup, Bev, you've recently played them in friendlies. You beat Australia both times. Nigeria, it was a win and a draw. Does that matter? Yeah, I think performing when it really matters is the critical point, and this really matters. I think the players might draw upon some of the confidence and the performances. Probably in the last year, our best performance was against Australia, so that'll give some confidence. But I do think Australia massively changed. You know, it's you scout me almost a different team in the way that they play. But I think, you know, we've, we've got to, we can't take e either of our group stage opponents for granted. It's a, it's a really difficult group. I think you look at most groups and you go, there's a given game. I don't think there's a given game in our group and that's exciting for us. That means we rise to the challenge. We take every game in front of us and we re respect the opponents as we always do. But I think deep down, if you're a player and you scored against Nigeria or you had a great game, that's going to help you. And there's a reason we designed the way that we, you know, approach this World Cup campaign. Um, but no, I think for me personally as a coach, I'm like clean slate. I've got to be better than the opposition coach in terms of scouting and knowing where this team's at now. Um, and we take every, every game that comes in front of us as a clean slate. You know, I had a chance to speak to Christine Sinclair and she acknowledged that a lot of the team's energy was elsewhere during the She Believes Cup and that needed to change for the World Cup. Are you noticing a more focused group this time around? One million percent. I think it's, for me, it's been a breath of fresh air the, the first week. People are focused, they're excited. You can feel that buzz of like, we're here, we're going to a World Cup. Um, and, and we've really pushed the group to say, you know what, whoever's in front of us in this tournament, how we train now for the next three weeks determines how well we do. So are you a worthy opponent for yourself, for the teammate next to you? So everything in training is super competitive and you're training like you're in a final, and that's how it's felt. But there's a level of lightness and enjoyment because I think one message I did put, the balance has got to be right, hence why we chose where we're at now, which is, you know, the Gold Coast, you're near the beach, there's a vibe, 
before you go into that sort of intense bubble when we head into Melbourne on, on July 16th. Bev, thanks for taking the time and best of luck. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Reminder to all you Soccer North fans that starting July 20th when the Canadian women kick off their World Cup campaign against Nigeria, Soccer North will be going live after every Canadian match on CBC Gem and the CBC Sports YouTube channel. And speaking of the Women's World Cup, Canada named their 23-player tournament roster over the weekend. Veteran Desiree Scott was left off the team. She continues to rehab a knee injury she suffered at the end of the 2022 season. And the Washington Spirits' Gabby Carl was a late addition to the team with defender Jade Rose suffering an injury in camp. The biggest surprise came with 18-year-old forward Olivia Smith being named to the squad. Here's the moment when she found out she'd be going to her first World Cup. Hey Liv, how are you doing? Good. I just thought we'd have a chance to connect after, before you went to Koala Sanctuary and a yeah. bit of a review after the last uh, few days. How have you found it all? Good. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I've been enjoying my time here. Okay. So. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, so listen, this might come as a bit of a shock to you, but you're going to the World Cup. Stop. You are? Yeah. I, um, I, you've come in, you've done outstanding. Um, you know, we've had some conversations along the way. You've gone away, you've worked hard, and I want to reward all your hard work. Um, you've come in, you've fit in really, really well, and there's no reason why you shouldn't be in the 23. So. Welcome. And I'm not the only one who thinks that either. You've come in and made a big impression, so. Yeah, well done. <laughs> You know who you need to give a call? Cindy and Joey. Because I know I know they pushed you. Um, yeah, well done. Big, You put a big shift in to get to where you are. Um, but massive well done. All right, so now you've got to call your family and tell them. Well done, Kira. Well done, congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> well done, you ain't expecting that, eh? <laughs> you got me in tears and I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> what a moment. I'm getting goosebumps just watching that video. Let's talk Olivia Smith a little bit more and the roster that will be representing Canada at the World Cup with Sharina Ahmed, who is going to Australia any minute now. Any minute. Any minute. I'm about to leave right now. <laughs> You're going to get on a plane. Right now. You're going to cover the World Cup. Olivia Smith. 18 years of age, <laughs> makes the roster. She was becoming a household name a little bit. Some people were hearing about her back in the spring, competing at the U-20 championship, helped Canada qualify for the U-20 World Cup. She can score some goals. Mm -hmm. Realistically, though, how much of the pitch do you think she'll see at this World Cup? For me, I was a bit of I was a bit surprised, and understanding that the midfield is a little bit, you could argue, there's it's a little thinner mm -hmm. than the back and the front. But the reality is, is that she's there because she's needed and she's a versatile player. She was presented as a forward, but will probably play mid. But that's the versatility we need at this point. And I think this is Bev Priestman, um, you know, strategizing and coming up with solutions and best practices for being able to put the best team. I mean, Bev Priestman herself said about that roster, it is super dynamic and exciting. Those yeah. were her words at the media call after the roster was announced. So I, I'm excited to see her. I love the idea of having some, she's not the youngest player we've ever seen mm -hmm. on the, the senior women's team. I mean, Jesse Fleming was an yeah. infant. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I mean, so 18, it, it, it doesn't seem overwhelming. And she was brought in, Smith was brought in as a training camp player. So mm -hmm. like the fact, and even the video, I'm saying to her, this might come as a shock. Like, it was wonderful. It was a very wholesome moment. And I'm excited because it also tells us that we have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. She also clearly has confidence in Deanne Rose, Nichelle Prince being fully healthy. We know recovering from an Achilles injury. Those are scary. Both of them suffering from that. Knowing that already Janine Becky is out with injury, but those two are back and healthy. Uh, you have Lacasse making uh, <laughs> making it as well. Heidema looking great in her pro game. How much confidence do you have in the offense for this team? The midfield is our engine, but we need the finishers. We yeah. need that strategy. But Nichelle Prince and Deanne Rose are what we would say seasoned. 
they have, you know, they have attended international competitions and mega events, they're gold medal winners. I think this is really important to understand that they have that experience. And as we have sort of a melange of younger players as well, you have that experience and that international experience will definitely come in handy in this tournament. The women, of course, are preparing for July 20th. That's their first game against Nigeria. And we want to continue talking about things on the pitch. But as we know, there are oftentimes stories that will catch our attention off the pitch. And one does involve Nigeria. And in a landmark decision, we know that FIFA has decided to pay the women directly because many of them, their federations, have not shown them that respect. Well, now we understand that because of the money that's being given to the players, Nigeria has stepped back and said, we will not give you your bonus money. That's not making the players happy, obviously. Where are we when it feels like you take one step forward and then your federations are making you take three steps back? Well, I think consistently with the Nigerian Federation, this is something I've written on, on the pay disputes and the disparity with stuff given to men. Nigeria are a staple at the Women's World Cup. They are AFCON winners. or The Super Falcons are traditionally a very, very strong team. I think it's really important to remember that. And this isn't specific to the Global South. I mean, obviously, pay disputes happen in the U.S. and Canada as well, mm -hmm. but also Jamaica. I mean, they had, it wasn't the players themselves, but a parent of one of the team set up a GoFundMe for them. But it's something that is really unfortunate you know especially we are so coming off so quickly off the men's world cup so it's really not difficult to say well they were given this what does it look like over here and one of the things that we can talk about forever is the labor mm. this is actual work this is them needing to know that they can rely on their federation on their countries so they can do their jobs their jobs are to win these matches they're to win this tournament so Pay equity isn't just about, you know, they want money. People are like, oh, they want money and this and that. No, it's about them being able to be in a place mentally so they can be physically present in order to win. And, you know, obviously the reports of Nigeria potentially boycotting are unconfirmed at this point. But there is, there are, there definitely are reports of them being at odds with their federation. Hopefully it can be resolved not just for them, but also the precedent that sets for women's sport. And for the Canadians, it's just focused. You got to practice and get ready as if that game is going to happen on July 20th, because that's what we want to see. <laughs> we want to see the footy and we look forward to all your coverage as well. Thank you. I will be messaging you and avoiding spiders from down under. This is our final show ahead of the Women's World Cup. We'll be back on Friday, July 21st, the morning after Canada's opening match against Nigeria. We'll have full reaction to the game on CBC Sports YouTube channel and CBC Jet. Be sure to join us. The Canadians brought us on such an incredible ride during the Tokyo Olympics when they changed the color, getting that gold. And even though they're entering this World Cup as the Olympic champions, you heard Christine St. Clair on last week's show. A lot of people felt they won that Olympic gold by fluke. So they know they still have a lot to prove and they are out to prove people wrong at this World Cup. So what do you say, Canada? Let's get ready for another incredible ride. And of course, we'll have you covered right here on Soccer North.